That's an hour. How long do I have? 20 minutes. Okay. Take your time. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a topic which, when um, Sri asked, oh, would you like to do a presentation, I thought, yeah, great, use the interface design. I can talk about X controls, Q controls, splitters, <laughs> cell panels, custom controls. I can talk about different types of picturing, how to extend them. And then I put the presentation together, and I realised huh, that I could easily talk for a few days. <laughs> so I'll spare you that. Um, instead, I chose, I think, the three most important and most powerful items to get a really professional looking user interface. So, splitters, panes, and sub-panels. Who here has used those three items before? Okay, maybe two-thirds of us. Um, hopefully in this presentation, we'll go through a couple of techniques that you haven't come across before. Um, also, can people on Teams hear me? Is it being uh, shared correctly? Yeah, I can hear you. Yep, perfect. <clears throat> Great, so I'm going to start off with uh, just a demo about splitters. And every time you put down a splitter, we create a brand new pane. So you get a two-in-one uh, demo here. Okay, so here I have a a really basic user interface. What I've put down, it looks like, at five splitters here. So each of these items is an individual splitter. To place down the splitter, you can right click, go down to layout, and then you have horizontal and vertical splitters here and here. You have modern ones, you have uh, NXG style ones here. Silver, uh, silver and system splitters. And once you've put down a splitter, you can right click and change the, the uh, splitter styling to choose uh, between them. So if you prefer one look over another, it's fine, you can just right click and change. So for now, I'll just show you putting down one type of splitter. And this splitter allows me to create a new pane, and all of these panes have unique properties associated with them. So if I just run this piece of code, I can make all of the scroll bars turn on. I can change all of the colors of the panes. I could change all of the colors of the splitters. Actually, let's turn off the scroll bars and show how I think this looks a lot nicer than where we had the scroll bars on before. Now, if we have a look at the code for this VI, notice how I'm just getting a reference to all of the panes and all of the splitters, where a pane is going to be one of these items, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rectangles, they're all panes, all of the splitters are the items that split up those panes. I could get a reference to an individual pane or splitter and decide to turn on or off the scroll bars, both vertical and horizontal scroll bars, for the individual panes, uh, the splitters, I could make them really thick or really thin. I can change the individual colors. I could prevent the user from clicking and dragging those pages. So I can stop people from doing that simply by locking it. Okay, let's uh, quickly run this and turn off uh, those scroll bars because I want to show you the one key feature that I use splitters for. That's mostly for scaling. So inside this pane here, um, I'm going to put down a, let's say, a graph control. Or a chart control. I'll right click, remove the label, and remove uh, the legend. I'm then going to right click and fit control to pane. Okay, great. It's Nicely scaled, it fits that pane. And imagine if I had 
other controls, maybe another one in this pen. I can right click and fit to pay. And so now let's say this application is running and I choose to resize the application. Notice how this one scales. If I move one of these splitters, the other one scales as well. And if I maximize it, all of these panes will scale. And it leads to a much nicer, much more professional user interface. But there are some things which I do for pretty much every application, and that's to have a status bar at the bottom. So regardless of how I scale my application, I want this status bar to always stay sort of this distance away from the bottom. If I can fill this pane and this pane with two text boxes, one for status, one for revision number. To do that, well, I'm going to right click that pane. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Uh, right click the pane and I'm going to lock it. But even though it's locked, notice how it's still getting bigger. So I also need to right click, go to split the sizing and tell it to stick to the bottom. So now when I run this VI, that splitter at the bottom always sticks, let's say 20 pixels away from the bottom. Oh. These splitters don't look great, do they? They're, I know they're purple, but ignoring the colour, let's say you have a text box here and a graph, you still have, what, maybe five pixels of dead space? That looks really awful. Um, so you can do things like look for the little nodes, you can't really say it on screen, but there are two little nodes there which I can click and sort of make bigger, I can try and make smaller, but by hand, that's sort of as small as you can get. I've managed to get two pixels before, but nothing less than that. So I've downloaded a, a plugin. It's a quick book plugin from JKI, Control Space, Control Shift A. Now that's going to open up a tool called Pain Relief. <laughs> um, and so, when that opens up, <coughs> now unfortunately, I had this issue previously, it's opened up on my other monitor. Um, but that's right, I have some screenshots uh, of it. But it's a really good plugin, I like it. It is yeah. a really good uh, plugin. We'll come back to this a little later on in the screenshot. Um, another piece of software I wanted to show you was a user interface prototype I'm working on at the moment. Um, so let's just. Is. Ah. I think that tool is modal. So it's we're not actually going to show anything. All right, I'll edit this out, it's fine. <laughs> Doesn't matter. All right. Did we, we disable will... demo mode? <laughs> <laughs> right, I've had worse things happen in that way. Um, okay, so the the demonstration which I'll about to show you is a user interface prototype I've been working on which uses lots of sub-panels, uses lots of splitters. Um, and it also does some neat things with uh, sliders and, and changing colours. There's also some examples of queue controls, which I'm definitely not going to have time to explain, but I'll leave that with you as homework uh, to look into. Okay, let's open up this launcher. Okay. Perfect, so here we have a user interface uh, prototype. 
There are a few key things here which I want to show you. So there are lots of uh, splitters. Some of them you can see because they're a different colour. For example, this paint and this paint, they're two different paints. There's a splitter that runs down the middle, but I've changed the colours of it, you can't really see. Here, there's a splitter running along the top. However, the splitter and the paint are the same colour, so again, you can't see. We can programmatically remove, uh, remove splitters. So, what you see at the top here, by the way, with home users, devices, and options, that's an example of a cube control. Um, if we add lots of devices on the left hand side here, you can see that it's updated and it always remains in the centre. The same for the right hand side here. This splitter, or the selections for this paint, always sit in the centre. And one last thing I'll show you in this demonstration. I've added more devices than you can see here, but as I showed you with scroll bars earlier, we can enable or disable them. Okay, obviously this uh, demo is a bit rough around the edges because I'm still actively developing this UI and getting my thoughts together. <coughs> uh, let's pin that and have a look at the colour scheme. So this UI has to be adaptable for use in a laser app where any light that's emitted can really affect results. However, if you're working behind the desk, perhaps you prefer light mode, perhaps you're working in a lab where, the, where you can only really use uh, red lights or you want a particular wavelength. Well, I've implemented various colour schemes into here. And again, it's still working prototype. Like these text colors or the labels, we can change those fairly trivially. I just haven't got around to it. So we've got light mode, dark mode, and we've got user defined mode. Uh, that. But let's close that. So hopefully that just gave you a bit of a, a thought about what's possible with these splitters and paints. So we had a look at light mode, dark mode, and user defined for different environments. Your user will use the software in. So you've got dark mode here, light mode, and user defined mode as well. And the way and the code behind the scenes is really straightforward. I have a simple ini file, INI file, that goes through. The current mode that's selected, light mode, dark mode, user defined, it then has different sections for what those different modes mean. I have five levels from background all the way to foreground of different colours, just written in hex here. For backgrounds, an accent colour, so uh, when that splitter slides in and out, that splitter changes colour to the accent. So the selected item will change to that accent colour. We then have complementary colours for the text, which, as you saw, I haven't actually implemented yet. But the code behind the scene is really straightforward, but it makes such a difference and makes a really professional application. And scroll bars. The custom, uh, sorry, the, the Windows 10 scroll bar looks fine if you're writing Windows 10 applications, but if you try and customise your UI, this scrollbar sticks out like a sore thumb. So I've made it so it's only visible to the panes that need it to be visible for. And again, the code behind the scenes, really straightforward. I get to reference to uh, the array. This is a picturing array. If that array is bigger than the pane, then show the scroll bar, else do not. Other things I wanted to implement, like keeping those selection items in the centre, 
again, every pane that you have on your uh, on your front panel has its own reference, and you can customize uh, the properties. I'm getting the total area of that pane, and I'm using uh, a scripting function called master uh, rectangle here, because this array could go into the uh, negative values of that pane, so beyond the origin point. Does that work in, when it's compiled? Yes. Uh, the things I showed you are actually uh, EPL. Okay. So everything that you can do manually, you can do programmatically with uh, panes and uh, splitters. So here we have a splitter reference, and you get access to the colours. You can be told if that splitter is vertical or horizontal, uh, the label. Now, if you don't change the label, you're just going to end up with splitter 1, splitter 2, splitter 3, etc. And that's no use at all. So you change the label, and you can use the pain relief tool uh, to do that. Uh, sizing and position. Now, uh, splitter position is what I was using to control the sliding in and out nature. The same with uh, paints. We can change the colour of the pen. Here we can change the labels. We can get references to all of the things inside that paint. So all of the controls and all of the decorations. <coughs> so if we don't want to have a splitter encapsulating every single control, we could do it a bit more programmatically instead of relying on LabVIEW to do it for us. Now this is what I was talking about, if you don't name your splitters and you don't name your panes, I have no idea what pane number 5 is. But that's where control space, control shift A comes into play with pane relief. So here I have another user interface where you can see all of these splitters. If I select a pane, let's say that one, at the bottom it allows me to change the label, I can give it a minimum paint size. So I've noticed, particularly with graphs, if you scale down a LabVIEW graph to less than maybe 100 by 100 pixels, the legend sort of gets confused and you start to lose your labels, your axis labels. So to get around that, I just put in 100. So LabVIEW doesn't fall over itself. You can change colors and scroll bars. Uh, the same is true for panes. So I've selected this pane up here. I called it ribbon splitter. It's got a position, but notice the size of that splitter is zero. It is zero pixels thick. That's something you can't do natively in that view. This is something which JKI are doing uh, <laughs> behind the scenes, and it is a little bit crashy, but it's it's really worth it. Um, but one thing I've noticed actually, if you set this to zero pixels or one pixel, um, if you have a private VI, so a VI that's marked as private in a class or a library, that VI will be removed from that class or library, but in your project it will have looked like it's done up inside of it. So you just have to close that view, open it up, click update, which is an option box I had never seen before. Uh, it then it starts working again. So <laughs> that's fine. And you can do sizing, so sticks to top, sticks to bottom, uh, sticks uh, proportionally. Um, you can call it locked. On another note here, if you have a locked splitter, that means the user can't click and drag it, but you can still programmatically move it about. So for example, this bit up here moves up and down depending on the menu option selected. That's done programmatically, even though it's locked to the user. Uh, download this from LB Tools Network. It's called Pain Relief. Okay, how am I doing for time? Take your time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, sub panels, who uses sub panels? One, two, three, okay. Let's get that number up. 
because sub panels allow us to just make such a dynamic user interface. Um, so yeah, I was going to very quickly demo uh, sub panels. That's my cursor. So this is a, an example that comes with the NI example finder. And if we run this, we have a sub-panel here in this rectangle. And we can choose the <laughs> <laughs> we can choose the VI that's displayed in that sub-panel. Okay, let's close that and go to well, okay. We go to help find examples. The demo gods really don't like this today, do they? That's right. Um, open up any example finder. Open up sub panels. If we run this, we've been able to insert the sine wave, sorry, the sine graph VI into this sub panel. Now, if we change this, let's say my, my user doesn't want to see a sine graph, they will see random data. So they can look at the asynchronous process that's doing all of your random uh, data manipulation. Then their border will see what the time is. Oh, I'm not too far away. Um, and all of these VIs are running asynchronously in the background, but you as a user can choose just to show one of them. And I'll stop that. Basically, to use a subpanel, you need to either get the VI reference to the subpanel or the subpanel reference to the VI. It doesn't matter which way you do it, so long as at some point they become buddies and you can insert the VI into the subpanel. The way that I mostly do this is I like to share the VI that I want to nest inside the subpanel to the subpanel. So I tend to do something like this, where this is an asynchronous process, it's a loop running somewhere. I send a message with the clonable name to the other loop that has the subpanel. I can then insert it. So I just go from the name, open a reference, and insert it. And I found that this is, um, this is a lot more successful than sharing the VI reference. Because weird things happen with references in that view, like having found a totally secure way of passing them. Even if you protect them inside the class, sometimes they go awry. Um, couple of gotchas, the VI to nest has to be closed. So a lot of the time we'll see this sort of design pattern. We get a reference and we see if it is anything but closed, we close it, we can then insert it into the subpanel. Uh, the the VI to nest doesn't actually have to be running. You could nest the non-running uh, VI. However, this VI would have to be running, the one that's actually got the, uh, the subpanel. In the user interface I showed you earlier, there are actually lots and lots of subpanels and lots and lots of nested subpanels as well. This is how I started off the application with a piece of whiteboard thinking. Here I have the very top level user interface that looks like this. It's a big empty shell. I have one massive subpanel here. I then have a status bar a splitter, and another uh, text indicator. Next to that, I have uh, this user interface. This user interface has two subpanels, one here, one here. There's another subpanel here. There's another subpanel right at the bottom. And all of those are split up with splitter bars. This has the functionality to open and close this ribbon space. 
So it does have some functionality. It's not just splitters and uh, sub panels. Next to that, we have something that's going to insert itself into that main uh, VI, as well as lots of others that fill in the other back spaces. We have a massive sub panel here, sub panel here, sub panel here, another sub panel that runs down the side. Inside this area here, we have another set of sub panels. This VI has the functionality to expand and retract these two splitters. But actually, I'm only moving the splitter on the left hand side, and I've told this splitter to stick to left. So if this one moves, this one has to move. And it will just move back and forth. I've got one, two, three sub panels there. In the now we get to the part where the user actually sees some stuff. Uh, I've got a graph here, control variables, a selector at the bottom, which I'm still to customize. And we fit all of these things together to make a really dynamic user interface. Now, the reason why I've made it so separated is, um, get that way, maybe. Let's say the user didn't want to have one, two, three items visible. Let's say they wanted just to monitor everything that's going on and have, I don't know, 20 sub panels. I can dynamically change this VI in for another one. If you see on, in the background, I've got this sub panel or this one, or this one or that one. This one could be whatever. And all of these devices, they can be changed as well. And the technique I've shown you just works. And this is still in active development, and I'm still working on uh, splitting in and out different sub panels, different splitters, etc. But so far, I'm really pleased with the results. Your question earlier of if it can be built, yep. Yeah. In fact, all of these modules are built into separate packages libraries. And so the actual executable is. I think 30 uh, kilobytes. The individual panels are a few hundred uh, kilobytes. Well, right, I'm over time, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm.